So essentially, I, I want to give Roos credit, essentially what he was doing is owning up to an intellectual problem that I think he's absolutely right about. Um, that is that the confidence that Darwinian evolution is the answer for how we got here is a deduction that one arrives at from the platform of metaphysical naturalism. Um, if there is no creator, then something like that must have happened. Uh, but if one does not make that conclusive presumption, um, then it seems rather more that what the Darwinian theory is, is the best guess that a, has been able to be made uh, by a scientific uh, community which is very eager to provide an answer to the question of how we got here, an answer that excludes a, a god, um, and very anxious to hold on to that answer, uh, but an answer which in fact is in conflict with the evidence at so many points that there's no reason uh, for most of us uh, to believe that it's true. Now, that's, I've given you um, the skeptic think and I've given you um, the reductionist think and I've given you um, the philosopher of science uh, think on this. Um, uh, let me conclude uh, uh, by um, uh, answering uh, uh, briefly the question, what should we make all of this? So how is this uh, important to us and, and what does all this mean uh, to most of us? Well, I might start um, with a quotation from one of my Berkeley colleagues, a famous philosopher of science named Paul Feyerabend, uh, something of a, uh, a radical in that uh, profession. Um, who remarked once, he said, scientists are not content with running their own playpens in accordance with what they regard as the rules of the scientific method. They want to universalize those rules. They want them to become part of society at large. And they use every means at their disposal, argument, propaganda, pressure tactics, intimidation, lobbying, to achieve their aims. Now that uh, may, might sound rather aggressive and even rather cynical, but in, in, in fact, point of fact, what Professor Feyerabend was saying was that one of the things that is going on with the scientific community is an attempt to impose their metaphysics on the society at large uh, because they believe that it's a very good way for people to think. Uh, Professor Weinberg is very explicit about this. So is Professor Ruse, by the way. Uh, so is Professor Gould. So are many others. That is to say, Professor Weinberg writes in his book in discussing why it's so important to educate people about science that he hopes that they will come to an understanding that the world is run by impersonal forces, that we are here as a result of impersonal material forces that care nothing about us, and that this will get rid of religion, which he regards as equivalent to superstition, and we'll all be better off. Um, this will make humanity at least more rational than it is, if not completely rational. Now, um, that's an interesting proposition. Um, and what it shows, I think, um, is that the program of science, of the kind of science that aspires to tell us the history of the cosmos, is a program that all of us have a stake in. Uh, because it's tremendous of importance to us to know the correct answer to questions like, are we here as a result of the action of a creator? Um, or are we um, uh, here as a result of material purposeless processes? We want to know the true answer, not to shield ourselves in some kind of an illusion. Uh, but we don't want to be misled uh, by scientific authorities who want us to believe one answer to that and who shape their evidence so that it can only support that answer. I think we want to, to know and, and uh, should want to know uh, whether, in fact, the evidence of science fairly evaluated supports this reductionist naturalistic program. It seems to me that it does not. In fact, it's a faith uh, which is in search of confirmation um, and which, uh, uh, because of that, has been uh, great, greatly uh, misleading to people who think they are hearing the objective uh, voice of science. Now, it's tremendously important then that we be able to ask questions, that we be able to challenge the reigning philosophical points of view that authorities like Michael Roos have agreed are there, philosophical assumptions that some of us might not share, might not want to make. But one of the problems is, is there's an authoritarian aspect to a certain kind of scientific thinking. Professor Weinberg, for example, believes 
that it is no business of citizens to ask about the religious implications of science, even though he himself asks this in a chapter called, What About God? and lays down this law. Um, Time Magazine uh, comes out with a cover story in December of this year, the Christmas issue, asking the question, what does science tell us about God? And the answer it gives is plenty and more all the time. That we are to take our knowledge of ultimate issues of where we came from, from science, but according to many of the scientific authorities, we are not allowed to question the assumptions that generated uh, those answers. Now, I think that this is a line that the scientific world will not be able to hold. Um, I had been hoping that it would be a part of the outcome of my own work that open and fair and honest discussion of the metaphysical biases and assumptions of the Darwinian project, and now as I see, of the reductionist scientific project at large, will become possible. Um, and I see that that is beginning to happen. And as that becomes possible, it's going to be tremendously important that as many people as uh, can do so in the universities, as many students among those who are here and others as can do so, learn to understand those questions and learn to understand what the philosophical assumptions are so that they can participate in that discussion. Because you know, we're entering into a new century. We're entering into a time when many of the old answers are crumbling all over the world. We're entering into a time in which very new ways of thinking will be necessary uh, to preserve civilization from certain anarchic and disruptive influences that are even now tearing it apart. And a new century will have new kinds of knowledge and new kinds of scientific thinking. There's no reason to assume that the dogmas that dominated the 20th century will necessarily and always uh, dominate the future of science and the future of thinking. So we're in a very exciting time. I'm excited to be participating in opening up the issues. And I'm very glad that all of you came to uh, uh, discuss uh, these uh, subjects uh, with me. And I'm looking forward to any of the questions uh, that you want to ask now in the remaining time. But thank you very much. Stephen Jay Gould has said that the two key features of the uh, fossil evidence are sudden appearance and stasis. And it seems to me that over the past 20 years or so in the creation and evolution debate, both evolutionists and creationists have been focusing on sudden appearance and trying to explain that, explain origins, uh, rather than the pervasive pattern of, uh, of natural history, and that is uh, stasis. I was just wondering if uh, in your talks with, with biologists, if, uh, if they have come up with any uh, either genetic or developmental or uh, ecological mechanisms which may account for stasis, um, do you think natural selection could account uh, for the fact that major evolutionary change does not seem to occur in the fossil evidence? And two, does speciation prevent major evolutionary change uh, as a result of saltation? <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I uh, think uh, um, that it's greed. I, I mean, that uh, uh, everybody um, that's uh, uh, writing about the fossil record now agrees that there is a prevailing pattern of stasis. That is to say, once things are in existence, they tend to stay more or less the same until they become extinct or until the present day if they're still around. Um, there's, there may be variation, and that is to say there's no change at all, but that there isn't change of a fundamental or directional nature that things um, uh, stay, um, uh, w w that the variation is within the type and, and uh, back and forth or, or of limited uh, uh, a nature and uh, that the, the pattern is this fundamental stability to things. Um, there's no doubt, and I think it's perfectly orthodox to say that one of the major things that produces this, this uh, stability is natural selection. Uh, because um, if things should happen to mutate or change, the likelihood is that this will make them less able to survive because almost all observable mutations are harmful. Um, and so natural se selection tends to weed out mutants and tends to keep things um, uh, 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 within uh, pretty much uh, uh, as, uh, uh, as they are. Um, and there may well be other mechanisms of, of stasis uh, as well. 
But the, the, the problem is that, for the, from the evolutionary biologist standpoint, that explaining the things in terms of stasis isn't terribly rewarding. Um, because um, while you can do it, um, and in fact it is done all the time, Another thing that is, is said is that there are developmental constraints. Only certain types of change are possible within the basic body plan that the animal has. Or most kinds of change would make it um, you know, out of sync with something else that, it, that natural selection would eliminate. It. So in a way, it's back to the, the problem of natural selection. But that's just explaining, explaining how things stay the same is not what evolutionary biologists have wanted to do. What they have wanted to do is to um, explain how things come into existence to tell the creation story for the culture, as it were. And so the emphasis has been to say that, well, what, what, the way that, that, that stasis is interpreted, interpreted is that it means that the change must occur when it does occur sufficiently rapidly and perhaps in sufficiently po small populations that it doesn't get recorded. You never see it happening. You just see that there's one thing here and then there's something somewhat different over there. And so there must be a process of change that must have happened somehow um, that just didn't get recorded. And so um, in a way, it's a very unempirical kind of, of interest because the, what is seen, the stasis, um, is, is, uh, is ignored. And for a long time, it couldn't even be reported in the scientific journals because it was thought to be of, of low interest. And what is, what is, in, what is hypothesized is the invisible process of change and development because that's what the culture wants, that's what, you know, what people want to provide. Uh, so um, um, when uh, Stephen Jay Gould and Niles Eldridge proposed the theory of punctuated equilibrium that many of you have heard of, uh, they both explained, uh, very frankly, that w what, what necessitated that theory was that it made it possible to report the prevailing fact of stasis in the fossil record which had previously been regarded as not worth reporting in scientific journals because it was just non-evidence of evolution, and who cares about that? So after the theory of punctuated equilibrium, it could be reported as support for the theory that evolution occurs in bursts of change in small populations, and that's why you never see it. Um, now, to my way of thinking, of course, the interesting thing that the punctuated equilibrium controversy brought out was the problem.